morning. My name is Ladislav H. And I'm, today I'm going to speak about the nonlinear continuum theory of finite deformation of elastoplastic media. I'm going to give, give this uh, talk on behalf of my co authors, Jarabek and Paul Elastos. Initially, I thought I would present a final version of the theory, but in the meantime, we, we find some issues. So, so, what I'm going to show today is, is rather theory in its stage of development. Um, um, there are two methods I present to model uh, finished, finite strain behavior of uh, material within the frame, framework of finite strain elastoplasticity. One is based on the additive decomposition of the uh, strain rate tensor into an elastic part and a plastic part. The method is considered to be an ad hoc extension of the small strain elastoplasticity theory into a area of finite deformations to cover large displacement but small elastic strains of the deforming body. It is typically used to, for modeling hyperelastic plastic materials whose constitutive equation exists in rate for me. There are some known issues with this method and uh, these are the, the, the following. Different ob objective stress rates result in different constitutive equations and a few of them exhibit unnatural physical behavior such as uh, share oscillation, uh, uh, energy accumulation along a close elastic strain path. We will also show that the method does not ensure the invariance or objectivity of the first time derivative of the equivalent stress. Therefore, the stress calculation in the related material models depend on the particularities of the model formulation. And uh, the second method, which is used uh, to model plastic behavior of material is based on the multiplicative split of the deformation gradient into the elastic part and the plastic part. If you look at the kinematic of motion as presented in contemporary textbooks, it looks like this. What we don't like about this kinematic is that actually this, this is not suitable for calculation because the material point moves during the deformation from point A into point without the existence of the displacement field. So this is actually a kind of cheating because if you look at the, the, the kinematic as it is uh, implemented into a finite element analysis, it looks like this. So the method considers the kinematic uh, of motion properly between the initial and the current configuration of the body, where the motion, the uh, displacement field is properly uh, uh, considered, but it neglects uh, these between the configuration when one is the inference. So the, the basically the, the, the point during the formation moves into the intermediate configuration without the displacement, which, which definitely uh, does not comply with the physics of the motion. So the, the, the theory assumes that the intermediate configuration of the body is thrust free, locally stress and stress for which no elastic and plastic deformation gradient exists that meet the conditions of compatibility. Uh, we will show here that actually, uh, if the, the kinematic of the, the, the motion is properly considered, then the two methods have to be equivalent and that the actually the, the plastic flow rule causes the problem with, with the physics of the motion. So next I'm going to outline the topics I'm going to deal with. So to, to develop a material model for, a continuum material model for finite strain elastoplasticity is a difficult uh, problem because first you have to describe the, the physics of the problem in such a way that so, so you have to describe mathematically the physics in a such a way that you cannot change the, the physics of the problem. And the second thing is that the continuum theory has a, has a specific feature, namely that it enables to the, to, uh, to describe the body behavior in whatever configuration of the body. It uses appropriate uh, transfer operations to transfer the loading from the current volume into the initial and intermediate volumes to create equivalent bodies with identical mechanical reserves. And this is really makes uh, the, the problem more difficult, which has several implications. So the implication is that the initial and the intermediate configuration of the body, which are 
stress fee in reality becomes stressed in continuum theory. The second, the objectivity requirements, which are considered to be issue to be an issue of constitutive modeling only, cannot be separated from balances and certain conservation laws. These in turn also affect the isotropy of the materials. And fourth, the material model has a description in all configuration and stress spaces of the body. The descriptions are related, therefore one has to be a reference and the rest, and the rest of them can be determined by appropriate transformation. So that the, 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 the consequence of this is that, that all the constitutive equations, the evolution equation, the yield surface, the normality rules, and, and even the internal variables of states, such as the accumulated uh, plastic strain or strain rate, uh, have forms in all configurations and stress spaces of the body. I denoted these topics uh, by Roman numerals one, two, three, because next I'm going to deal or, or to speak about this. So let's start with the physics. So the, the physics of the problem cannot be uh, changed. So the physics of the problem is actually uh, uh, closely related to the integrability of the deformation gradient. Uh, so, so what what the so let's start with the compatibility conditions. So, what are the compatibility conditions? If we know the displacement field, we can easily determine the deformation gradient of the body. If we have an opposite problem where we know the deformation gradient but need to determine the displacement field, then we have a problem because uh, it, it cannot be done unless the deformation gradient meets the conditions of compatibility. So the conditions of compatibility are, are an additional constraint equation which the deformation gradient have to meet. And uh, the integrability is actually, we use the stochastic term to determine the integrality of the body. And, and as a sufficient and necessary condition of the integrability that this stochastic theorem has to be zero. So let's imagine, so let's uh, cut our body into half by a, an imaginary cutting place. So what you, can, what you can hear is the cross section of the body. And let's consider an arbitrary area on this cross section determined by a closed curve. So the stochastic theorem says that the line integral of the deformation gradient around this closed line is equals to the area integral of the product of the surface normal and the curl of the deformation gradient. So if the, the stochastic theorem has to be zero, then it, it implies that this curl of the deformation the gradient have to this. So, so this is a necessary and con so these are actually the compatibility conditions which the deformation gradient has to met. It can be shown that as far as the definition of the, uh, so all, all tensors which, all second order tensors which are defined as a gradient of a vector actually meet this stochastic theorem. So all are, are integrable. So as far as the definition of the deformation concerned is an integrable tensor. So, so both the, the deformation gradient and the displacement field are integrable. And therefore, therefore so, so the, the proof of the integrability is, is, is actually this one. So we can multiply this uh, curl by a constant C vector and manipulate the result into the curl of the gradient of a scalar, which is well known to be zero. And because C is an arbitrarily non-zero vector, then it implies that, that the gradient and, and the, the displacement field are actually integrable. So, so, so the results, so when we integrate this deformation gradient in this form, we will arrive at the well-known uh, kinematic uh, relations, which says that the position vector of a point a special point is equal with the position vector of the material point before deformation plus the displacement field. So this well-known equation for the con continuum mechanism is actually the result of the integrability of the deformation gradient. Just in the same manner, one can prove that as far as the definition of the plastic 
and the elastic deformation gradients are, are concerned and all of them are compatible tensors. So here we can show that the, the total deformation gradient is uh, uh, integrable and therefore must exist uh, this kinematic relationship between the position vector, uh, the material and the, and the displacement field. And uh, please note that uh, not only the deformation gradient, but also the time derivative of the deformation gradient uh, meets the uh, requirements of objectivity. Now, if we look at the multiplicative split of the deformation gradient, just we can also prove that as far as the definition of these tensors are concerned and all of them are integrable. So, so the, the proper, so, so therefore the Eulerian displacement field, which is defined over the intermediate volume of the body, body has a Lagrangian form because it's a, a domain of definition is actually the image of the plastic deformation. So you can see this, this Lagrangian form is just uh, the, the, the function when we substitute this, this expression for this xi. So, 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 so it has a Lagrangian form and, and the proper Lagrangian form of the multiplicative split of the deformation is actually based on the additive split of the Lagrangian displacement field. Now let's return back to this equation again. So this is, this says that the time derivative of the plastic of the of the deformation gradient has to be also uh, co co uh, compatible. So when we substitute this equation into here, then we will arrive at that both the plastic deformation gradient and the uh, or or the uh, gradient of the plastic velocity field and a gradient of the velocity field has to meet the conditions of compatibility. But this equation actually is closely related to the, the flow rule. So the plastic flow rule, so when we express the special gradient of the uh, velocity field, we look at this, this, this special gradient of the uh, LRM velocity field, which is uh, the velocity defined at this point is determined by, by this flow rule. So when we replace this equation with this one, that the compatibility condition requires that this curl also has to be a zero, but at present it is not. So this is actually the, the problem of the, so if we use a, a, a flow rule, a plastic flow rule, which is not compatible, turns out then we actually destroy the physics of the deformation. But if one uh, uh, term on the left hand side is, is not a compatible tensor, then the whole tensor is incompatible. So, so the, so the uh, basically the, the contemporary plus multiplicative models are neither correct physically nor mathematically. Um, now let's take a look at issues number two and number three. So I said that a, a specific feature of the continuum mechanic is that it enables to, to describe the body behavior in whatever configuration of the body. So it, it does it in, in this way. Uh, so let's take a, 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 a infinitesimal element in the current configuration, then if we make sure that the force acting on the surface is the same and the rate of change of the internal energy is the same, then the description of the problem is equivalent. So basically we need an Anzon formula which says how the, how the area changes during deformation, we need how, how the volume changes and we need the Cauchy stress theorem. Then when, when we write the force equilibrium, then we can determine that, that actually the stress in the intermediate configuration, which is stress free and relative, becomes stressed and, and the value of the stress is this one. 
Now, if you look at the invariance or objective requirements, so this is actually, then you will find, so by substituting this equation into this, uh, into the second one and manipulating, we will arrive at the, the corresponding or, or the conjugate strain rate tensor, which is this one, which is uh, associated with, with this tensor. So you can see that the intermediate and the, in, and the initial configuration are actually not stressed. And the objectivity requirement, which is the interpower is causally related to the balance of force and the conservation of energy. So this, this makes really the formulation much more difficult. Now let's start uh, with, with the continuum theory or the development. So as I said, the proper Lagrangian form of the deformation gradient is actually based on the uh, additive split of the Lagrangian displacement theory, the elastic part and the plastic part. The material strain rate tensor then can additively divide it into the elastic part and the plastic part where you can hear the elastic velocity vector gradient and the plastic velocity gradient. Now, if you look at the flow rule, so this is what we have done um, incorrectly in our previous version, that because this flow rule does not meet the compatibility uh, conditions, that basically the formula is, is, is not correct. So here we are trying, and of course the spatial strain returns are just can be calculated by, by push forward operation of this material strain returns are into the elastic base. Now, here we basically so, so so this tensor have to be compatible in locally and uh, here we are trying uh, uh, to develop a, a, a second plastic rule which is defined plastic floor which is defined in this way where case uh, uh, a constant a uh, positive constant between zero and one and uh, we replaced the yield surface normal with this tensor you can see that so, so this floor rule actually, or at least locally, uh, meets the compatibility condition. So the tensor is integrable. The, and the physical meaning is of, of this change is just, just, we actually keep the elastic and plastic velocity field uh, direction is the same as the, 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 the total velocity uh, vector. So basically it, it, is, it is actually a logical change because, because when, when the yield limit of the material is reached, then the, the, the deformation or the, the, the velocity basically is not, is, is cannot be changed. Now, then the material strain rate tensor can additively be, be decomposed into the elastic part and the plastic part where it gives a, a plastic multiplier. Here you can see the forms and in the same matter, manner can we determine the spatial velocity field and the Kuntikan uh, continuous optimization problem will take the following form. So the K is a number between zero and one. We require that the yield surface or, or the yield surface be less or equal to zero. And this is the constant and the plastic consistency condition then become this one. Now, because before I continue, let me just show to, uh, speak about objectivity. Uh, imagine that we have two, uh, sorry. So we have two observers, observer one, who is connected to the reference coordinate system and observer two, who is connected to his own co coordinate system. So let's assume that at time zero, the, the coordinate system of the two observers coincide and at time greater than zero, this second or, or observer start, start to move arbitrarily in space. Now what, the images what observer A or to see obviously is different. And let's uh, consider a material tensor, a spatial tensor 
in, in these curl figures. So when we depict the images seen by observer A and two into a common coordinate system, you will see this one. We have one initial coordinate system or we have uh, the initial uh, configuration of the body is the same, but we have two uh, current configuration which are actually just rotated because uh, because they, the, there is just a rigid motion, the difference between these two configuration. So the objectivity requirements says, so, or, or require that, um, so, so the scalar variables have to be the same, irrespective if they are, they are defined over the initial configuration or the current configuration of the, the material tensors have to be also same. The vectors, the spatial vector have to undergo this rotation where Q is the relative rotation of the coordinate system of the second observatory track, the, uh, the first one. The mixed base tensor have to undergo this rotation and uh, the spatial second order tensor have to under such a rotation. So these are the requirements of objectivity. Now, in order to extend the theory to cover constitutive equations in red forms, we need to, uh, we need to generalize the Cauchy stress term here. Uh, basically, the objective derivative of the surface structure vector can, can be determined as the product of the objective rate of the uh, first piola kirchhoff tensor and the yield surface normal. So this is, and actually denotes the objective derivative of the surface structure vector. So if n is zero, we, we recover the well-known Cauchy stress dome. Then when we write the general force equilibrium for each n, and also required that the nth time derivative of the mechanical power be the same, then we will arrive at these two equations. So we can determine the relationship between the objective rates, which are the following. Now, you can see that in each, in each stress phase, we have not only conjugate pairs of stress tensors and strain rate tensor, but also have conjugate derivative operators and conjugate pairs of objective derivatives, which ensure the invariability or objectivity of the and derivative of the mechanical power. So in the second piola kirchhoff we have the second phase space, we have the second piola kirchhoff test tensor and the material strain rate tensor. We use the, the ordinary time derivative as we have to use and the conjugate pairs are the following. In the first piola kirchhoff stress space, we have the first piola kirchhoff stress tensor and the time derivative of the deformation gradient and the, the conjugate pairs of uh, objective derivative operators are actually the lead derivative operators. They, uh, if you look at it, they are not the same, but they do the thing. So they convert the tensor into the initial con configuration. Then the, the derivative is uh, calculated and it, so it push back, then, then it puts it, put it forward. In the Kirchhoff stress space, we have the Kirchhoff stress and the spatial stair rate tensor and the con conjugate pairs of objective operator is the and uh, objective and the uh, uh, Oldroyd derivative of the Kirchhoff test tensor and the uh, lead derivative of the uh, spatial stain rate tensor. And in the Cauchy stress space, we have the Cauchy stress tensor, the uh, spatial strain rate tensor, the end the rate of the tensor and the lead derivative. So, so these are actually the only correct uh, objective operation which can be used. And uh, please also note that, not, uh, um, that uh, oh, okay, so, so let's go forward. Uh, now, as I said, the, the third one, the, the material model must have a, a description in, in all stress spaces. Because we have various stress measures, it is natural that the equivalent stress also has various forms in all stress space. So let's denote the 
the definition of the yield surface as this one, as, so it is actually in always is, is in a form that the equivalent stress minus the yield stress in the second pla kirchhoff first pla kirchhoff and uh, Cauchy stress space. Now, it can be shown, I, I, I'm not going to do this, that this equivalent stress can also be described in these forms. Yeah, so it has such a, it is an alternative description of the equivalent stress. Then the requirements of the objectivity requires that this equivalent stress, the relationship between this equivalent stress has to be so they basically has to be the same in the uh, second pillar Kirchhoff, third pillar and Kirchhoff stress space. And this has to be a product of the deformation gradient and the equivalent stress in the uh, Cauchy stress space. So when we combine these equations, then which we actually can find the relationship between various equivalent stresses. So, so this is actually the, the relationship between various equivalent stresses. This means that one, equivalent stress and, and the same applies to the uh, yield surfaces. So this means that one definition of the yield surface has to be a reference and the rest of them can, can be calculated. Now, if you want to describe the relationship between uh, objective rates. So first let's start with the time derivative of the uh, equivalent stress. It can be expressed in this form, as I said, or showed when we work in the uh, the second periodic we can we have used the we have to use the ordinary time derivative details. Now we can manipulate this model just by using equivalent manipulation in this form. So we can actually find the relationship between all of the, all of uh, the tensors, and this is actually nothing else but the the requirement of objectivity. So here you can see how we manipulate this tensor into the Cauchy stress space, where we use the relationship that uh, this product, so, so this, this, this product, uh, uh, so, so this, this comes from the previous page. So this product, uh, so this uh, yield surface normal, is actually equal to the yield surface normal of the tensor in the Cauchy stress space. Now, so here just I summarize the results. So the objectivity requirements uh, implied, or, or so in order to meet the objectivity requirements, the, the first equation I have to apply. This can equivalently write in this form. And when we work in the rate, in the rate uh, when we use the rate form of the equation then uh, so, so the time derivative of the uh, equivalent stress which also meet the objective requirements will be this in this form. So please note that this equation number two and equation three because they are actually normality rules and these actually determine how, what, how to calculate the plastic multiplier of the uh, a plastic multiply in order that the objectivity be maintained. And the alternative forms of these two equations are just this one. So, so basically, this is a kind of uh, an extensive quality, uh, physical quality, which, which where the ob objective requirements imply the following relationship between them. Now, the relationship between the accumulated stresses. Now, as I show, we have different plastic, uh, uh, plastic uh, deformation rates. So there, there, it means that we must have uh, corresponding equivalent stresses and these must be related where delta is a constant. So each of them is a reference. That's a definition of these can, can be expressed in this form. So again, you can easily verify that these equations, the alternative forms, if this equation is this one. Yeah. So it, it is also the derivative of, of, of this. So, it, so, so, so the equivalent alternative form is this one. Now the objectivity requirements, uh, 
uh, implies that these are scalar variables, and so it implies that these equivalent stresses or uh, strain rates have to be accumulated strain rates have to be equivalent. So when we uh, substitute these equations into so these two into equation three and use some manipulation and utilize the properties that these yield surface normals are, are symmetric, then we will arrive at the relationship between the equivalent stresses. So, so you can see that not so that each of them must have a form in all stress spaces. Now, now let's look at how, how these uh, uh, how these equations uh, change the calculations. So there are two types of material. One is based on the hyperelastic uh, material models, where the constitutive equation is. Uh, uh, determined as, as a derivative of the strain energy density with, with uh, elastic strain tensor. So the kinematics is, is modified as this one. Let's consider one Mises equation. We can uh, say it, the alternative or not normality rule form is this one. So we basically we solve the the equation of the yield surface when we calculate the plastic multiplier. Now if the, the, the second type is, is the hypoelastic hypoelastic plastic material models. Here you can see that the objectivity requirements imply the, the following relationship between the, the constitutive equation. So, so these rate forms actually obey the same transformation rules as the strength stones. And again, the kinematic relation will be changed like this one. And uh, again, we need to use the, the second uh, second time. So the rate form of uh, the rectum map mapping procedure here. So we use we need to use the objective derivative of the yield surface. And when we work in the Cauchy stress space, we show that we have to use the third the third the derivative. So we have to use this equation to calculate the, the plastic multiplier in order that the uh, first time derivative of the plastic power be the same. And basically this is all. So the evolution equations uh, actually have to obey the same transformation rules. So basically you can see they, uh, they uh, obey the same transformation. So in, in the case of hyperelastic plastic material, we use the rate form of the constitution equation. And in, in the case of hyperelastic plastic models, we use the incremental forms where we have replaced this derivative with, with the particular objective rate. So, so this is the uh, old droid rate of the uh, Baxter stanza, and this is the truth. This is the, the, uh, the please note that this 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 term, this is actually the scaled value of the the uh, Baxter from the previous time stuff, and we need to scale this value because uh, you can sh you, you can easily prove that uh, even if there is no plastic step in the material, the, the back stress will change because we need to maintain the objectivity. So imagine that in Kirchhoff, in the Cauchy stress space, uh, there is no elastic step. So, so the, the back stress tensor does not change, but in the other stress spaces, for instance, in the first pillar, I'm sorry, Kirchhoff stress space, the, the value of the back stress changes because the deformation gradient changes. So, so this equation is actually the scaled value of this back stress. Um, now here you can see the uh, retro mapping procedure or the physical meaning. If you work in, in, in the second period like Kirchhoff uh, stress space, the the retour mapping is, is basically very similar to the vector mapping procedure is used in small strain analysis, but when we work in uh, the 
uh, first PLA Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff or Cauchy stress space, it, it changes that, that, that this, this uh, so this, uh, the, the position vector of the Baxter tensor, it, it moves even if in elastic loading. So, so between two time steps that this, this vector moves from this point into this one because we change the deformation gradient. So, so that is why we need to use the objective derivative of the of the yield surface to calculate the multiplastic multiplier. Here you can see the objective return mapping algorithm. So the most important step is that we need to scale the tensor from the previous uh, time step in order to, to get it value in the current time step. So this. This is the scaling. So we basically just replace this deformation gradient from the previous time stuff into the current time stuff. So the elastic product, product, product predictor, it looks like this. So when we use the hip elastic plastic, hip elastic plastic material, it looks like this. And when we use the hip elastic based material model, we use the kind of the constitutive equation. And then uh, we need to check the plastic compatibility with, with the modified stress tensor. And if the step is not elastic, we need to calculate the plastic multiplier and the values of the stresses, either by using the definition of the corresponding yield surface or the objective derivative of the yield surface. Now let's uh, look at the thermodynamic consistency, which is uh, related to the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, 